All right, welcome everybody. I am so glad that you are here. Um, I am Adrienne Klein. I am the Programs and Operations Specialist here at Oregon Bioscience Incubator. Welcome to this Lunch and Learn on Nuts and Bolts of Biotech IP Strategy. So while we get settled, I have some housekeeping items here. We ask that you please stay muted, um, but please introduce yourself in the chat. Um, and use the chat for questions because we're going to cover all the questions at the end of the session during the Q&A portion of the program. Um, I'll also put my LinkedIn in the chat and feel free to connect with me. And um, also Renee Miller, who is the Associate Director, she's here too. She's gonna put her LinkedIn in the chat as well. Feel free to connect with her. Please take a moment to read through um, our land acknowledgement. Um, this is Leading with Tradition, a document created by the Portland Indian Leaders Roundtable. And we will also put a link to that in our chat for you. All right, let's get started. So in this Lunch and Learn, Catherine Rubino joins OBI to talk about the current landscape of intellectual property in the life sciences industry, including recent trends in patent filings, offensive assert, assert, assertions, and licensing deals. The discussion will highlight the importance of protecting IP for attracting funding and preventing unfair competition. Uh, Catherine Rubino is the partner and director of life sciences practice, Katie focuses on representing life sciences companies, discovering, developing, protecting, and offering pharmaceuticals, therapeutic vaccines, digital health, medical devices, biologics, and antibody products. Katie has been featured in the Wall Street Journal, Fox Business, and Nature Biotechnology for her intellectual prowess in governing legal and scientific disputes. Katie specializes in transactions involving intellectual property rights, strategic partnerships, licensing, and research collaborations. In addition, she maintains an active practice in cross-border transactions, being duly qualified to practice in both the United States and England and Wales. Katie is the chair of the Chemistry and Law Division of the American Chemical Society, and she's a fixture of the entrepreneurial ecosystem and provides pro bono legal advice in partnership with MIT Sandbox and Oregon Bioscience Incubator. So without further ado, please welcome Katie. Thank you, Adrian, and so nice to have everybody here. And um, just a little bit as I set up my screen sharing here, a little bit about how I met Renee and OBI was about four years ago during the COVID pandemic when everything had to go virtual and I saw there were opportunities to uh, mentor and kind of integrate in with OBI. And so I met Renee kind of by chance and now I've been a mentor for the past few years and it's been just a really great opportunity to get to work with a lot of startups who are really working on some incredible science and technology. So thank you so much for having me here. And today we're going to be talking about intellectual property. And I know this is a very important topic for a lot of startups and companies. So I'm going to make sure we have plenty of time at the end to answer all your questions. Now, really quickly here before I get going, I have to just give a disclaimer, which is that everything I talk about today is for educational purposes only and not for the purposes of providing legal advice. So what we're going to be talking about first are all the different forms of intellectual property. I think this is an important topic to touch upon because as a business is first starting out and getting going, a lot of times they're generating a lot of IP, but they don't even realize it. And so I hope today we can talk a little bit about ways to recognize the IP that you're creating in your business. 
And how do we go about protecting that IP? And then in the second part, we're going to talk about once we do acquire the intellectual property, how do we then monetize it and use it as an asset class for our business that we can generate revenue and a return on investment from? So there's a lot of different forms of intellectual property. And probably when we think about IP, the first thing that comes to everybody's mind is a patent. And what a patent does basically, this is a right to exclude others from practicing your invention. And what it is basically, you file your patent application, it will get examined by patent examiners. And then eventually a really exciting day will come when you receive what's called this notice of allowance. And what that means is that your patent has now been approved and you're going to get this right to practice this invention for the next 20 years from the filing date of the patent. And so that's an important concept to think about here because patents are good, utility patents, and I'll talk about what that means in a minute, are good for you know a pretty long time. And a lot of times people wonder, well, if when the 20 years are up, can I extend the patent? Because maybe I've really created this novel drug or this novel breakthrough, scientific breakthrough. And so, yes, there are ways to kind of extend it. And that gets into some of the patent strategy about ways in which to kind of create what we'll refer to as these patent thickets that basically kind of stagger patent filings around different areas of your invention to kind of prolong the lifetime of the exclusivity of the patent. Now, as far as types of patents, so the most common one are utility patents. These are patents on inventions that are useful. So this would be anything that say a composition of matter, a new drug molecule, a new manufacturing process, a new medical device, any of that would fall into the category of utility patent. Then we have design patents. And design patents are a little bit different. They're not good for 20 years. They're only good for 15 years from filing. Um, so you get a little bit shorter lifetime exclusivity. But what a design patent does is protects the ornamental features of a product. So these are not very common if you're a small molecule drug company. This would more be applicable if you're a medical device company. And let's say you've created some new medical device that has a very unique shape or look to it. That would be a reason to file a design patent. And a lot of times you can file on one invention, multiple patents. So you could file, let's say this new medical device has some new method of treating sleep apnea. So you could obtain a utility patent on that part of the device. And then you could also simultaneously or later on also obtain a patent on the look of the device too. And then the last type of patent here is what we call plant patents. These are kind of very rare. They're more common if you're doing, let's say, some work in the cannabis space because a lot of times if you've created a new strain of plant, that would be the time you would obtain, think about obtaining a plant patent. And um, also if you know you have like, if you do a lot of work in say agriculture, I have a friend who's an attorney in I Iowa, and so he does a lot of plant patents for the University of Iowa because they are making all these new strains of sweet potatoes there. So that would be an area, but sort of the, that's a niche area of patent law. And so then as far as utility patents go, we get a little bit more nuanced here because 
there are different forms of utility patents. So probably the one we're most familiar with is what we call a provisional patent. This is, I like to tell clients this, think of this as a placeholder patent. This is kind of a rough draft patent application. You would write it up, file it at the patent office, and it will get you a filing date. And for in the world of patents, that filing date is sort of the most important aspect of the invention because the right now we're in a first to file patent system. So what that means is who's ever first in time to file the patent at the patent office, they get rights to the invention. So what the provisional does, it gets filed, gets you that filing date. And the, the kind of weird part about it is it never gets examined by a patent examiner. It's going to just sit there for that year. And then when the year is up, you either have to convert it into the full non-provisional patent or it will just lapse and you won't have any rights in the invention anymore. Now, the non-provisional application, this is the real deal patent application. So this is sort of the final draft. This is the one that's going to get examined by patent examiners. And usually if you file a non-provisional patent application, what happens is you'll file the application, it will sit at the patent office and you might hear something in like three years. And usually the first thing you're gonna hear back is what's going to be called this office action or a rejection. Extremely common. This happens in basically every patent that gets filed. Um, I've maybe had five patents out of thousands that just go straight through without getting rejected, but so that's very rare. And what happens when you receive that rejection is essentially the patent office is saying, hey, um, there might be some aspects of this that maybe there's other people doing something similar, or maybe there's something that if we combine a bunch of different things, it would be obvious to think of this invention, but don't get too concerned about rejections. The whole part, it's just part of the process. And what we found to be kind of very valuable is when you get the rejection, you usually have six months to respond. And so you can respond in writing and just, you know, give your negotiation that way. But what we found to be too useful is you have a right as the patent owner to have at least one phone call interview with the patent examiner. And we found that's a useful way to kind of speed up the arguments and the rounds of rejections, because if you can have a conversation and kind of understand where the patent examiner is coming from and why they're rejecting it, and they're going to have some questions on their end too about the technology and kind of how does it work and how is it different than what they might have found in their search, that kind of helps communicate to them kind of what's most crucial to the invention. And a lot of times, that can kind of speed up the prosecution. Now, you, so usually I'd say from start to finish, the whole process could take anywhere from three to five years, which is a very long time. And especially for a lot of people on the call today, you're all startups who are growing fast and can kind of sometimes hinder fundraising efforts to just say, well, I have this patent, but it could be, you know, three more years before I have any success there. So what the patent office did a few years ago in 2013, when they redid our entire patent system, was they started this newer program called a track one review. And what that is, you basically pay the government a little bit more money in government filing fees, but you get a determination of patentability within one year from filing. So what that means is 
you could have those rejections and the whole examination of the process from start to finish take about 12 to 15 months, which is very fast. And if you're a startup looking to raise capital, being able to tell investors, hey, I have this actual issued approved patent in hand can kind of give you more leverage and help secure the funding a little bit easier. And so that's just a useful tool, you know, I like to tell people about because this is a relatively newer program. Right now, the patent office only allows about 15,000 patents per year to be filed on this track one program. And so if you are filing patents, it's just a useful little thing to keep in mind if it is really an invention that's worth expediting quicker. And then this last category here is called continuation applications. And this kind of, these come into play later on because once your patent gets approved, you then have 90 days from when you receive the notice of allowance until the patent is actually going to issue. And it's that date that the patent issues that rights then attach in this piece of property. And that's when on that issue date, any time from that issue date moving forward, that's when you could go sue a competitor for patent infringement. So what part of the patent strategy involves is before that issue date, you can file what's called this continuation application, or sometimes you'll hear it referred to as a child patent. And this is when we start to create what we call these patent families, because what the continuation does is it claims priority to the filing date of your first patent, what we consider the parent patent application but it will have a new invention created in it. So it's a separate patent in its own right, but it keeps open that original filing date. And this becomes important later on because let's say some infringer pops up and it's five years down the road. And let's say we can't prove the infringement 100%. There's maybe some element in our patent we don't, we're not sure if they're really practicing that. Not the end of the world because by having these child or continuation patents filed on there, we can then write a new patent dating back to five years earlier to claim the infringement as it's happening so long as we have support in the application. And so it allows us to kind of date back years behind to capture infringers as new potential competitors come into the marketplace. So this is sort of a tool and a strategy and continuations are also important. We'll talk about this later when we're looking at creating valuable assets for our business because patents that have these continuations filed on them that have these families grown out, they're generally given greater valuations than patents that just, you know, that just have one patent and it's closed off. We can't file anything new. And so it's just something to kind of keep in mind as you're working through your patent strategy. Now, parts of a utility patent application. So the main what if you've ever had experience with patents or maybe you're just you've looked at patents online you'll notice that patents are typically pretty long and as you start to read through them you'll realize too they're very technical and so the main thing to remember here is that there are essentially two main parts of the patent all this long stuff at the beginning that's what we call the specification. And that's what is really kind of the broadest part of the patent. And those specifications kind of define and provide examples of everything you are claiming is in your invention. And the reason this part is written very broadly 
and this also kind of plays into a patent strategy here is that if you have in a the in the US, the bar to patentability is very low. And so what I mean by that is really the only thing the patent office has said you cannot get a patent on is basically a time machine because they know those are theoretically impossible. So what that means is that as we're writing these patents, we can write them very broadly. We never have to show that the invention works, that we've created the invention. We don't have to have data on the invention. And so intentionally, this specification is written to try and come up with as many other examples and ways of doing our invention as we can, because what that's going to do is block others from being able to make one simple modification to your invention and work around the scope of your patent. And then the second main part of the patent is this section called the claims. And these are always at the end of the patent. You'll see this listing of these 20 things at the end. And what the claims do, the claims in comparison to the specification, they're a lot more specific and kind of targeted. And the claims are the legally enforceable part of the invention. That's the part that you're saying, hey, these are the meets and bounds of what I've created here. And so if an infringer comes up, somebody starts stealing your technology, creating the same thing, in order to win in a lawsuit, you would have to show the infringer is practicing those elements in the claims. And that's what also kind of feeds in to this strategy on these child continuation patents, because if let's say one of those elements is we don't know if the infringer is doing that, not the end of the world. We just file a new continuation. We take that element we can't prove out of there. And then we have this patent that we can prove infringement on and go after that kind of bad actor there. All right, now requirements to obtain a patent. Again, requirements here, it's a pretty low bar. There's really three main things you have to show to get a patent. First, utility. And what this just means is that what you're creating, there has to be some sort of usefulness to it. And then it has to be new, meaning nobody else has done it before. And it has to be non-obvious. Now, this is kind of a very obtuse area of patent law. And really what non-obvious means is that what if you've ever received a patent rejection for one of for non-obviousness, essentially what the patent office there is saying is that nobody has done this before. What you've created here is very new. However, if I pulled bits and pieces of let's say two or more inventions that already existed and I put them together, then it would have been obvious to create your invention. And so this is a common area of rejection, what we call these non-obvious, or you'll see them cited as a 103 rejection. This is very common for a couple of reasons. Number one, because essentially, inventions are the sum of known parts. And so it's kind of the unique way in which you put those parts together that lends to inventions. And so a lot of times this is sort of the last ground of rejection you're going to receive from the patent office because it is kind of this subjective area in argument. And so a lot of times when you go to write your patent application, uh, you can do a lot of kind of forward leaning prevention of this ground to kind of emphasize in what are the parts of my invention that I that are really kind of have never been done before that wouldn't somebody else who's kind of practicing in this field wouldn't have think thought of to do. And so there can be some strategy here 
in the process to really kind of emphasize that, to have something to point out to the examiner to get around some of these grounds of rejection. But again, they're just very common. And usually there's ways to kind of argue back and forth with the examiner to clear these rejections up here. And then again, this slide is all about different statutory categories of invention. So essentially, the patent office has said in order to obtain a patent, your invention must relate to one of these different categories. And so in the life science area, where a lot of our inventions fall, would be under different processes, could be different manufacturing processes of drugs, different synthesizing processes, or even different processes to treat different disease states. And then also in the area of compositions of matter, if we've created some new chemical compound, some new drug, some new biologic, those would all be protected as compositions of matter. And I would say an area where I'm seeing a lot of innovation, particularly in the life sciences, is kind of this crossover between these drug molecules or biologics and also some sort of computer software that, let's say, is helping us source drug targets, treat disease states, model potential drug compositions. And so this new area in the past five years or so are surrounding bioinformatics. How do we kind of use computers to assist us in our drug research and drug treatment process? This is becoming a very kind of um, hot area for patenting because this is so new and because a lot of these traditional technology-based tools are bleeding over into the life sciences. Again, as I said earlier, in the US, our patent system, we're now in alignment with most other countries around the globe where we have a first inventor to file. And basically what that means is timing, whoever thinks of it, that doesn't matter anymore. What matters is who is first in line to go file the patent application at the patent office. Now, speaking about other countries and other patent systems around the world, a question I get a lot of time is, well, if I file my patent in the US and somebody starts infringing me in France, can I then go assert my US patent against them in France? And the answer there is that no, patents in each country are limited to the territorial region of the patent. So in the US, by having a US patent, what that means is that you can stop others who infringe in the US and you can also stop infringing products from being imported into US borders. But as far as being able to go enforce the patent in Canada, let's say, you would have to get a Canadian patent in order to do so. And Part of sort of the strategy around international patents is the thing to remember here is that even if you um, file international patents, you there's ways, the different ways you can file international patents. And I won't get into this in a lot of detail because it's very technical, but the thing to remember is that it's go you're going to have to go through rejections and arguments and prosecution in each country that you want your patent examined in. And so that can take time. It can be expensive. And what you really want to think about there is you're not going to be able to file this all over the globe, right? It's just going to be way too expensive and time consuming. And so when you're thinking about countries of where to file, you want to think about what's going to really make sense for my business. Where are maybe some countries where I might sell my product, where I might have manufacturing facilities. Those would be countries that protection is going to be more important. And also thinking about the strength of different patent systems, because in the U.S., we're very fortunate in that we have a very 
uh, sophisticated patent system that allows for complex damages, meaning monetary awards for patent infringement. Other countries like Canada, they don't have a damages system. So what that means is that if somebody's infringing your patent there, you're only going to recover an injunction, which means you're going to stop them from infringing, but you're not going to recover any damages from that. And so all of these factors have to be considered as you start to think about what are some of these other jurisdictions I might want to go file my patent in. Now, segueing over into another area of intellectual property, what kind of goes hand in hand with patents are what we call trade secrets. And really trade secrets just means what are all of the different, maybe unique processes, ideas, maybe not even fully fleshed out ideas yet, but all of the kind of our companies know how, all of our confidential information. And these could be things that we may never protect with any form of intellectual property. We might five years down the road, take a trade secret and create a patent, or we might just continue to hold these as trade secrets. And these are, even though they are trade secrets and the whole kind of rationale behind them is that we have to keep them secret. There are ways they can still add value and there might be certain ideas that are trade secrets that we may never want to patent because patents will eventually publish and we might have some things we don't want to put out there that we're doing because as soon as it gets out there, it could be very easy to reverse engineer and copy. And probably one of the most famous examples of a trade secret is the recipe for Coca-Cola. So that's an invention that has never been patented. It's been a trade secret for over a hundred years. And that is just known by very few people at the company. And there can be kind of different checks and balances to put in place with employees surrounding confidentiality to make sure they continue to hold these trade secrets as secret and confidential over time. So the next area of intellectual property we'll talk about briefly that goes kind of hand in hand with trade with patents as well is what we call trademarks. And trademarks for these, think about your branding. So these are going to be your company's logo, design. If we're looking at a small molecule drug company, could be the name of your drug product. Those are all going to be protectable with trademarks. And these are, again, different forms of assets we can protect to add value to our business. And down the road, we can always license these, sell them, but can be important to kind of get trademarks filed early, similar to patents, because you don't want to be in a situation where somebody else already has the mark registered, and then you're kind of blocked or prevented from using that mark. Okay, and then lastly, we have copyrights. Copyrights protect a lot of different types of works. So copyrights protect things such as written works, books, articles, content on websites. They can also protect different artistic works, music, sounds, movies. And with copyrights, a copyright, as soon as you have one of these works in a fixed medium, meaning you, know, you have a sound recorded or you have your book written, you have a copyright that exists automatically. What you wanna do though is take the next step and register your copyright at the copyright office because you need to have the work registered in order to sue somebody for infringement if somebody plagiarizes the work. And so that's a part that sometimes people forget to do. It's pretty straightforward to register the copyright. Most of the time, 
my clients just do it themselves because you just sign on to the copyright website and do it, you know, check a few boxes, pay a little bit of money, and then your copyright will grant in about like five to seven days. It's pretty quick. It's a lot easier, quicker, more streamlined than the whole patent process. Okay, so now we're going to talk briefly about monetizing intellectual property. And what I mean by this is once we have, let's say, received some patents, we have those allowed patents or we have some of those trademarks, what do we then do with them, right? We have these pieces of paper from the government. A lot of times I have people tell me, Katie, I don't even know where to begin. And so what I want to talk about today is just what are the different ways we can then use these assets for our business and generate a return on investment. And really, the reason this is such a very important topic is because over time, over the past 40 years, there's been this huge shift in companies unlocking the value of intangible assets. And so in back here in 1975, intangibles only made up about 17% of the value of the S&P 500. Whereas by 2020, those intangibles have made up almost 90% of the value of those companies. And so there's a lot of different ways in which we can generate value. And um, I'll touch on kind of each of these and what these sort of different scenarios look like. Now, from the patent side, what I have on this screen here, I get this question all the time. You know, I've filed a patent. What is my patent worth? And that's a hard question to answer, especially if we're just looking at kind of one patent alone in a vacuum. And so on here, there's just some sort of benchmark numbers of what is the value of different patents coming from the only data that really exists in this area from patents that are sold on the brokered patent market. And what this is basically, this is not reflecting the value of patent assets, let's say sold in an M&A type transaction in some kind of, you know, big pharma acquires the startup and buys their patents. These are gonna be patents that are sold through patent brokers where these are patents that are being sold off because companies are going out of business. They need to generate money quickly. And so what that means is these are kind of bottom of the barrel on our worst day. If we had to go close up and sell off this patent, what kind of money can I expect to return on it? And so there's a couple different columns here. So typically this first column this is sort of the average asking price if you have just this pending patent application that you're gonna go sell off, doesn't even have to be allowed or approved. And we can typically on average expect about $178,000 worth of value there. As soon as that patent is approved, you can see the price goes up dramatically, almost doubles in price, because at that point, your rights have attached and you have actual rights in your patented invention. And then this last column, this is the price per patent family. So this means once we file that continuation that we talked about, you can see how the valuation and the value just continues to go up. And so I point this out only because a lot of times Founders don't really think about the IP as an asset. They think, oh, I have to just protect this invention. And yes, that is one part of it. But we also want to kind of think long term and figure out once we do have this asset, how are we going to use it to our advantage here and really use it as a tool for our business? And so another way we can really extract value from patent assets is if a company is gearing up for an IPO, meaning a public offering, and typically on average, 
we can expect anywhere from like a 12 to 15% higher company valuation right before first public offering, just if we have a patent portfolio. And that's a huge advantage when we're talking about a multiplier of that magnitude of millions of dollars of value. And I put in here, this is just kind of one example of a drug company that use this technique. So this was a company, Rani Therapeutics. They make orally available biological drugs. So most biological drugs have to be given intravenous, but they created this new mechanism of delivery. And what they did is they, as you can see here in the chart, kind of intentionally over time, built up this patent portfolio to then in 2022, extract a lot of value when they went public. And they had on opening day, a stock value of $11 per share and a valuation of over $75 million, which is huge. Yeah. Now, another way we can also monetize and extract value from patents, and this is kind of probably most pertinent to everybody on the call today is for fundraising. So, Typically, on average, almost 60% of VC funding goes to startups that have patents. And the reason being that if you're a VC funder, you want to know and have kind of surety that the, the ideas and the know-how of the company are locked down and protected. And so I hear from clients all the time especially in the life sciences industry. It's just because of the pace of technology and just the tremendous value in some of these drug compounds and molecules, the investors, they want to know that their investment is secure and that they're not going to be investing in a company where somebody else can just come in and steal the IP and rip it off there. And then another area too, that's emerging, I would say, especially in the past three years where traditional venture funding has been very tough to obtain, it's been slow, and dollar amounts have been low, is instead of using it for traditional capital raises, is now there's different programs that exist that allow your portfolio to be valued and you can get debt-based fundraising. And that can be a great way to kind of bridge the gap of funding between different funding rounds and use it as a debt note that is determined based on the value of your portfolio. And I've seen, you know, different portfolios um, valued and usually they obtain about a 50% loan to value amount on the portfolio valuation. And it's a great way to kind of get an influx of capital, not have to give up or dilute company ownership and be able to use it for kind of scaling, growth, R&D type purposes. And then another way we can also create value is, and this is a very common technique, I think, especially in the past five years, I've seen a lot more deals of, I want to use my portfolio to go work and partner with Big Pharma. And especially, too, in a lot of very niche areas in the life sciences, big pharma, you know, they're not going to go put together a team to study some particular disease state. They'd rather outsource it and partner with a startup that's hyper-focused on that area. And so we can use, if we have these assets protected, sometimes I've had companies that just sell their assets totally to big pharma, right? They have an exit or they kind of jointly collaborate and come up with some maybe new um, IP together, but they have this kind of foundational IP protected when they go start those conversations. And these are just some examples of some of these collaborations. Pfizer struck a deal on some CRISPR editing technology from a startup called Beam Therapeutics. Uh, Moderna used paid $45 million for a license to use some of the uh, CARD-M technology for oncology purposes. 
And then we had a $3 billion deal with Bristol Myers Squibb and Century Therapeutics on different cell lines. So these can be kind of very high value deals that if the IP is kind of locked down, we can use that to really extract even more value from. And so just to kind of really summarize here, how can we use our portfolio to really create business opportunities? Really kind of figuring out what's going on in the industry, what are other companies doing, who's coming onto the market, how am I as a business kind of differentiating from that? What are the problems I'm trying to solve? And then creating a plan to kind of leverage and extract value from these technologies. And so just key takeaways, really it comes down to thinking about from the beginning, from that startup phase, what do I wanna go do as a business? And how am I going to align my portfolio and my goals and my targets to really help me go achieve those objectives? All right, so I know that was a lot to cover in a little bit of time, but we I wanted to make sure we have plenty of time here for a question and answer. So if you have any questions, please drop it in the chat and we can uh, get started on it conversation here. So Katie, that was wonderful. We do have a couple of questions that were dropped into the chat. Um, the first one uh, says, I'm curious about the continuation applications. If the first patent contains claims that are not granted, can you then submit those claims with additional data to support in a continuation application? Or in other words, if you give examples in the original parent application, the broad section, but the exact material of said example is not claimed, can the child application have the exact material as the claim? Uh, yes, so this, this situation happens all the time. And yes, you can definitely do that. A lot of times what's kind of interesting is that the patent office, it's made up of all of these different groups of patent examiners who each have kind of areas of expertise and knowledge. And so a lot of times you might file your patent and get put into this group of examiners that are just terrible, meaning they're just slow, they reject things a lot, and they have really low rates of allowance, which tells me, okay, it's going to take a long time to really get something through here. So a very common technique here is to, if we get assigned to this really bad examiner, we can always file the continuation and try our luck again to get a new examiner with, you know, write new claims. Maybe we have new data that we're going to incorporate and try to optimize our outcomes with a different patent examiner there. So this is a very common kind of technique that happens. Perfect. Next question, is there any further guidance on the non-obvious innovation, particularly in the small molecule space, or is this more up to the subjective opinion of the reviewer? For instance, if I increase the solubility or bioavailability of a compound by switching out certain components of the molecule, would that be eligible for a new patent? Ah, uh, okay, good question. So. Something like that, if you've created something that does increase the solubility of the compound, let's say, then that's probably enough to get around this obviousness type rejection. The thing is, it's, it's a very subjective argument and it really comes down to each particular examiner's interpretation of what it means. So a lot of times the best way to kind of anticipate it and figure out what should I really emphasize in my patent application is to do what we call a patentability search before you write your application. And what that is basically, it's a search that looks at what other patents or maybe publications exist in your field of technology already so that you we know okay 
from a baseline perspective, what's already been done before or tried to be patented. And then based on what comes up in that search, we can figure out where's the white space here. And then how do we write this in a way to kind of carve out as much white space as we can to kind of differentiate ourselves from what's already been done before there. Excellent. Can a US IP attorney file patents in other countries? Oh, good question. So the answer there is usually no. They would have to be uh, licensed to practice in the jurisdiction where you would want to go file it. So what happens most of the time is companies will file in the U.S. first, and then their U.S. counsel will, we always have contacts around the world, right? Different kind of foreign agents who we work for, we help them with filings in the U.S., and they help us with filings in other countries. So if I have a client who, let's say, wants to go file a patent in Brazil, then I would just go instruct the Brazilian attorney and kind of work with them and tell them, hey, here's kind of some arguments that worked when we were rejected here in the U.S., because it can always help them to kind of know what was successful in other countries to kind of speed up the rejections there. So a lot of times it's a lot of kind of working together with different attorneys around the world in these other jurisdictions that a client wants to go file in. Okay, I have one more question unless someone else wants to drop another one in the chat. Um, I have heard about general rules of thumb for differentiation of in specific product classes. For example, monoclonal antibodies must have X amino acid differences. Is there any official basis for this, or is this also just subjective based on examiners? Yeah, also kind of subjective based on examiners. Um, you know, obviously, if you're just going to change one amino acid, that's probably not going to be enough, right, to get around what a competitor or even, you know, someone else has done. But I would say, you know, it all comes down to kind of intentionally trying to write the patent in a way that creates opportunities to kind of differentiate from some a couple different perspectives so that you're not just relying on one factor because the other kind of secret here is that if let's say we have, you know, inevitably, during the course of the examination of the patent in this sort of negotiation with the examiner, you always usually have to make some kind of change to the application than how it was when you first filed it, because there's always kind of a give and take. And so let's say you have to make some amendment in there that's a little bit narrow, right? It's like, ooh, does this really cover exactly what we're going to go sell? Maybe not not the end of the world, that's okay, because in that continuation, we can always broaden it back out to try and recapture what we gave up in that first one, because continuations, they're usually assigned to the same patent examiner if you file them kind of at the end when the patent is allowed. And so once you kind of get that first win with the patent examiner, getting the win the second time, it comes easier, it goes quicker, and we can really kind of broaden things back out there. So it's always kind of a, a game and a little bit of a moving target, but that's where, too, writing the patent a little bit broader to encapsulate some of these other things, it's not going to be harmful because then we have extra things to kind of fall back on, and we can always try to come back from that later on. Okay, we have one last question that just came up. If we have some, yeah, we have a little bit of time. Um, for the child application, does the time of use match the original filing or does the 20 year clock start with the child application filing date? Okay, good question. So usually it's gonna, um, tw it will be 20 years from the parent date. 
So you will lose a little bit of term on the back end there, meaning um, if the continuation is filed, you know, three years into the term of the parents, 20 years, you're not going to get a new clock of 20 years, right? It's going to expire in 17 years when the parent does. The way you can kind of extend the clock is to file what we call it's a different kind of child patent. It's called, you'll hear it referred to as a continuation in part or CIP. And what that does, that will have some material from the filing date originally, but you'll also have some new matter in that. And so if you have new matter, that will get a new filing date. And so that new matter will restart 20 years on the new stuff. But the only problem is that if let's say somebody else is already doing it, you're not gonna, with that new stuff, you're not gonna have the benefit of that earlier filing date there. So it's kind of a give and take in a balancing act a little bit. Fantastic. Um, I wanna thank everyone for an outstanding um, discussion and big special thanks to Katie for sharing her valuable insights and experiences, which I think has greatly expanded our view of IP law. Um, I want to let everyone know that this program has been recorded and I will be sending out that recording um, sometime this week uh, or next week. And um, stick around to the end. Um, once you um, log off, a survey will pop up. And I would love it if everyone would take a moment and just fill out that survey for us. Um, we uh, th thank you for coming. Uh, we hope to see you again at next event soon. Our next Lunch and Learn is April 3rd and registration is open for that. So please visit our website to sign up for that. It's gonna be amazing. And thank you everyone. <laughs>